do a quick intro. Okay, cool. So second week of our DeFi uh, data science hacking series. So like, I guess we'll just continue on where we left off uh, in the first week. So uh, as I said before, um, in the last series of hacking sessions we ran, we ended up talking, uh, kind of defining the battle for about two weeks. And then we, we started digging into the coding and data science and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I think to start to narrow in on a problem that we wanted to solve uh, last week. But at the very end, I th then I think we uh, we diverged a little bit with some uh, some different projects, uh, different, different ideas. So maybe I guess um, we could just uh, have an analysis of, of where we got to last time and um, and what we need to do in this meeting. So. I think we had we had defined a metric that we were interested in and uh, some sort of data set that we can build to uh, maybe experiment with training a model. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I guess what, what, what did everyone think about that idea? And um, like, is everyone starting to narrow in on a, on a problem that we should solve or uh, what do you guys think? I think I heard everything you said. It is quite choppy. Um, right. Yeah, sorry. Weird. I was like trying to listen. Um, but I think you asked if we narrowed in on a problem. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if I recall correctly, the majority of the time we were talking about um, like a metric that's like the total cost of borrowing. But then I'm pretty sure at the end, we talked about something else. Uh, I think Jakob had like a suggestion right at, like right at the end that we all thought was pretty cool. I just don't remember exactly what it was. I think we talked about using, uh, so training a machine learning model to, well, training multiple machine learning models to try to predict which parameters are play the biggest role in in the borrow rates. So like, I think basically just getting getting the data about uh from like ave or other protocols and then try to build a predict a model that's going to predict the borrow rates based on the data and then just try to take out certain variables and try to see what how the performance changes So I think if I great. remember correctly, uh, the first step would be just uh, figuring out which variables are probably affecting more those 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 rates, and after that, like a, a kind of a, a second step would be using those variables to try to, to make some predictions. Right. Okay. Yeah. And like specifically to the thing that you guys were uh, like a window we're looking at was the idea of finding scenarios in which uh the cost of borrow like the deposit apy and the rewards api combined is greater than the cost of borrowing right and taking advantage of that but also figuring out which variables influence those types of situations to occur right yeah yeah it, and just to give give you a bit of color on that you know we, we've um you know thanks to your help actually christian with with the data we, we're able to 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 show kind of a back-tested uh, strategy, but there are these moments historically where where it blips a little bit, um, not a little bit actually, blips a lot. Uh, so um, it would be very interesting to see. I don't know if we could, if that's a pure data science problem, but we could see what is the the cause of those blips and and can we somehow predict predict those or, or you know, figure out the cause effect relationship. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, if if we're more or less in in a in a rough consensus on on what what would be interesting, um, what do you guys think of like how how we would break this down into actual work that we can we can divvy up? Anybody have a, an idea? Maybe as a first step, um, I don't. I can't remember the name of of the tool you suggested christian i think for for querying the protocols was it data something 
Dune, yeah, Dune's good yeah. for just querying using SQL. Um, I posted something actually in, I know it was late yesterday, but I posted uh, quite unrelated, but the synthetics docs, um, they have this thing where like they talk about integrating synthetics data like into your DAP. And like, we don't want to do that, but the, they kind of describe like the different ways in which you can retrieve historical data. And um, like, they definitely leave out like a lot of third parties and things like that. But I think overall, like what they describe is pretty interesting. Um, so like one is the graph, which we talked about. Um, one is querying event logs directly via uh, the EVM. One is archive nodes, which is kind of expensive. You have to run your own um, archive node, archive node, and then the third one, or sorry, the fourth one is third-party services. So like Dune Analytics, Google BigQuery, um, and I think the easiest one to use initially is probably just like a third-party service, like Dune Analytics, or I don't know, like another um, API service that like is fairly all-encompassing. Um, but I guess it just depends on which protocols we're looking at. Like if we um, if we can decide right now, like on a couple protocols to grab historical data for, then, you know, we can choose the, uh, just like the path of least resistance. Um, yeah, that's the link. In terms of like, if Dune Analytics has all of those smart contracts decoded, then it's probably just the easiest way to go. I think it might be, uh, I don't know how exactly how detailed the data is, but I think that maybe for like for a training model, if, if it's like a JSON file, then we might, like, firstly, we'll have to create the, the training data set. So, well, first, it's, firstly, we'll have to query the data of the smart contracts. But then I presume the borrow rates will be somewhere separate. So we'll have to, so we'll have to match those to create a data set, which we, which we can perhaps publish on the Ocean Marketplace as well. So we can um, keep the sort of decentralized uh, data science workflow. And... I think that's that might that might take a while because I presume there's going to be some learning curve to that. So the good thing about Dune is that uh, the output is basically like a relational database, like rows and columns. So that's the advantage of using Dune is you basically already get like a training data set that I imagine most algorithms would use as input. Um, and if we're talking about like Aave, Compound, like major protocols, all of their data is on there. And there's already queries that are like everything on Dune is basically open source unless you, I mean, if people make their queries or their dashboards public, then you can just see them. Um, and in my experience, the majority of uh, like borrowing rates and things like that, someone's already done the work there. Um, so we can just basically find the queries that find that data, maybe tweak it a little bit for our purposes and then like download it into a CSV. I have the Dune Pro account, so I can download it. Um, and then, I mean, it's like 200 bucks or something, but, uh, and then we can just use, go from there, I guess, um, if that makes sense. I think so. Um, so on, on what changed Ethereum itself or, you know, like a, a polygon, uh, layer two, any thoughts? I would like to see some, some polygon and maybe avalanche just because the cost of borrowing can be cheaper on, on some of those protocols operating on those blockchains. I think there is some good opportunities in there. And also we have to think uh, about gas costs. And I think that's something we're going to track over time, I imagine. And it's just cheaper to do it in Avalanche or Polygon. Yeah, I guess it depends like if this is catered towards, um, you know, like retail or whales or like funds, right? Um, yeah. Cause like, if you're messing with, you know, a hundred K plus, or maybe like a male plus, then those costs are pretty negligible, but for anyone else, it's a big deal. Yeah. We, we actually made a, an obvious, but, but not, not that obvious, um, uh, insight yesterday. We we're speaking with a, a prospect, you know, that, that let's call them a, a whale or an inst a small institution. And they said, yeah, we're totally totally on board, let's do this. Ethereum chain looks fine, but we want to test with something smaller. So like you could imagine if, if, if someone has um, 
let's say a million bucks that they want to actually invest, they, they will want to test with 10,000 bucks or, you know, so it's like, I guess all, all this, all this leads us to some sort of the need to be on a, 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 a more scaled chain, um, even just to, for people to kick the tires. So I don't know what that would be. I mean, Polygon comes to mind first, but you know, the, everything's evolving quite quickly. So even for institutions, I think we need to have a, a, a more scaled chain as well as perhaps Ethereum. Cool, that makes sense. So I think probably the fastest way is if we decide on a couple of protocols, like if, you're, if you already had a few in line, then we can just basically check if they have, uh, like if they've deployed on other blockchains or on L2s um, and go from there. Yeah, I, I think just up, just a quick, quick pass. I would say, you know, Ethereum, Polygon, Aave, Compound. So like those two chains, those two protocols, and maybe the top three. Yeah, I would either say like a couple of the stable coins, USDC plus another, or alternatively, Ethereum itself. Um, yeah. I don't know if anyone has a strong opinion on that. I, I think for, for, for sure, everyone is excited about stable coins like that. That's got to be in there. Um, but um, maybe Ethereum as well. I don't know. Uh, I, I would like to expand a little bit more on the protocols. I think you mentioned Aven Compound, but I think there is a lot in there that we can, we can find. So for example, DYDX, you have also cream.finance. Cream and I, I guess we, we wouldn't want to you know, miss opportunities. And I guess just the more protocols, the better. Is there some way we could incorporate Ocean Protocol as well, just for, uh, you know, uh, just for tying in with previous things? Um, I think like, uh, like on Ocean, for example, I think something where you classify a data set based on some metrics is really useful. Like uh, there's been a lot of rope pulls and stuff like that. And so um, like, I guess there's no like cost of borrowing or anything on Ocean at the moment, but um, it could be interesting to like to try to use Ocean as well. I think it could be interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on what, what that might look like? What, what, what type of data would we capture in? And how, and what we predict? Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, I, like it's. I, I don't really know. It's just thinking of from the top of my head. But um, so like some some way to extract parameters from certain data assets and out and algorithms uh, and like classify them based on uh, how risky they might be, based on uh, similarity with previous assets and stuff like that could be really useful. Um, I guess not a lot of assets really get sold in the ocean ecosystem. So there's a question of whether we have enough data and stuff, but I can see some of these models that we're using being useful in the ocean ecosystem. Um, and also we have close ties with ocean and also ocean provide funding for different projects. So like there's a few reasons that we, that it would be nice to include ocean, but uh, it might be stretching it a bit. Also, Richard, do you think it's um, in terms of in terms of finding which variables ha uh, have the greatest impact on prediction? I wonder whether we can maybe figure that out from the single model, like from uh, from from the hidden from like the weights of the hidden layers, without actually needing to retrain a bunch of models with different parameters. It's quite difficult to do this with neural networks. Like uh, there's other machine learning models that do this like almost out of the box, like random forests and stuff like that. So like random forests, they they like create branches in the tree based on like the strongest features. And so once you've created your random forest or decision tree, you can almost just read off the parameters that are the most important. So we can play around with those as machine learning models. Um, but I don't know if there's any way to do them with neural networks outside of the way that you said, where you just uh, take away some parameters each time. I, like, I don't really have a handle on how long it's gonna take to train these models. I've never trained on data like this before. 
maybe Iago, you could, uh, maybe you have some experience training a neural network on financial blockchain data. Uh, honestly, not not too much, but on, on the problem on, on choosing the variables, you can make a simple uh, test running a, a linear regression where you can just run hypothesis tests over each variable and you calculate the, which one has the higher, uh, I don't know, remember the number, the name of the coefficient, but you can, you can calculate how much one variable is affecting the output. Uh, it's probably not the most accurate way of doing this, but it's a place to start. Anyone have any thoughts on this? Yeah, we can try all of these. I think it would be really interesting to explore these types of ideas. Yeah, so yeah so, uh, I, I get the... I, uh, please, go ahead, Christian. Oh, sorry, this was a comment that's not related. I was just looking at like whether uh, what networks Aave and Compound are on. Um, so Aave is on, uh, you know, um, L1, ETH, uh, Polygon, and Avalanche. I don't think compounds on anything except uh, mainnet, though. Hmm. Yeah, just wanted to. Yeah. That. Are there any other other um, borrowing protocols that we think are, are worthwhile? You know, like maybe maybe even um, MakerDAO itself, or, or do you think that's a little bit too too outside of? Because uh, and Compound are, are quite similar. But uh, the way Maker does does the 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 borrowing is a bit different. Do you, do you think that would be outside of a scope, Christian? Any any thoughts? Uh, I mean, you can pretty much only borrow Dai, right? On Oasis, borrow actually. So Oasis is like the borrowing DAP built on top of Maker, um, mm -hmm. where you can open faults. Um, I mean, I think it's fair yeah. to, to use it, uh, to include it. I think I'm trying to find like on their site, like what, if it's just on L1, pretty sure it is. Yeah, I think so well. While you're looking at that, y Jakob, I have a kind of a question for you. So when we're thinking about these these parameters that if I understand correctly, it's like, well, let's look at other things besides just the borrow lend rates to see what is influencing the, those rates. Um, we'd have to kind of like list a bunch of candidates um, and just take a, a guess at what we think might be influencing, capture the data and then start analyzing. Is that the, the process? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think that right, right now it is kind of uh, like, Determining the parameters is very ad hoc right now, but maybe but I think that last time uh, we talked about how there are parameters that we don't even know about that might influence influence this. So maybe we can try try to figure out what these might be. Like um, I don't know. Does maybe maybe do uh, do different protocols influence each other in a certain way? Like does do the do the borrowing rates on compound influence the ones on Aave? Maybe some like awesome, yeah, like a competitive uh, scenario. Interesting. Yeah, actually, as you're answering the my question, I was thinking we could probably come up with at least five parameters that that we we think um, influence the rates. For example, um, you have utilization rate. Um, you've got just volume, um, Yago, you probably, you, you've looked at the data more than I, maybe you have some other other um, parameters, but th there are like these these parameters that um, that we know, you know, just from the documentation of, of in, in, in Compound that, that do influence the, the rates. So we'd start there. Um, and, and I think above anything we do, I, I would like to, and this is probably super easy to get, but just, just look at the gas gas prices um, in a in a granular way because I think things will probably change when when gas spikes up because of like nowadays it's more stable but you know um, when OpenSea did a a drop um, and we didn't have you know EIP one five five nine like that would I'm sure that it affected the rates somehow 
Um, so that could be useful as well. Yeah, I think that there, there are variables inside those protocols that we're probably, I guess most people aren't considering when looking at this boring rates. So as Greg said, the utilization rate, the, the volume, you know, all of this protocol data that could be affecting. But as Jakob said, if we're, we're looking at, at those data sets and there is a correlation between borrowing rates between different protocols, then there might be a general variable on the blockchain or, or in the market itself that's that's driving those rates. And I, 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 just, I think we've got to look at, at both of those both of those, those variables. Uh, I think one place to start is just listing variables that we, we think that might affect. Uh, see if if we, we can get the historical for them in the protocol, in the graph, if it's blockchain data, where we're gonna have to look at. Just listing the all of the most stuff you can, can think of. And from there, we can start digging. Cool. Well, let's let's do this just to capture it. Um, for lack of a better place, I'll just put it in the chat. Okay, so let's try to to scope this out. So, right now we've got. Um, well, let's start high level. So, what change do we think should be within the, the scope of this this first first phase? So we think Ethereum plus Polygon, Ethereum plus Polygon plus Avalanche. Anybody have a strong opinion on that? I like Ethereum and Polygon, but I can't think of another landing protocol on Polygon besides Aave. Do you guys know anything mm. that's operating there? Yeah, I think maybe like the more strategic approach is to think about protocols and then see if they're what markets they're on or what chains they're on. Yep. Um, yep. I like that. Yeah. So let me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to not DeFi Llama. There's DeFi rates. They're pretty good on the. Oh, perfect. Yeah, DeFi rate. Thanks. They have a lot of the centralized um, organizations as well, but we kind of want to throw those out. Yeah, so it's just basically compound of a um, DYDX. I don't know how. Yeah. I don't know if. Do we, do, does anyone use D, DYDX? Do, do we think that that should be in the scope? I think if you just look at like the, you know, like TVL of each one, if it's above a certain size, then, you know, I think it's fair to include. I mean, like one thing that that is a huge rabbit hole in and of itself is like risk, like smart contract risk. Um, but we can probably ignore that for now. Um, but yeah, compound of a DYDX. I mean, like cream was one that everyone was like popular, right? And then it got uh, yeah. exploited um, multiple times. Yeah. There's Maker. Yeah, Maker, which I think you use oasis.app um, to access that. Um, I guess those are the major ones, Fulcrum. I, I think it's a, it's a good place to start already. Mm -hmm. I think there's enough data there because there's so much available as collateral and to borrow. Like there's so many permutations of what you can do. Um, so on yeah. where, sorry? Like on just the major protocols. Like if you just think about okay, Aave, yeah. you know, like what you can deposit versus like what you can borrow. Uh, like there's a pretty high number of asset, like crypto assets and stable coins that you, that you can mess around with. Um, but maybe uh, like just for simplicity like we can um like share our screen or something and like walk through what the process of you know like actually borrowing from Aave looks like so we can see like you know what the steps are and like what uh, variables would like from a user's point of view would be affecting like the decision you know um i don't know that might be an easy way to do it sure. yeah that'd be great would you would you be comfortable throwing up your screen or you prefer that idea? Yeah, I can do it. I can do it. That would be a great idea. Can you see it? Yep. Yep. Okay, let's see. So yeah, all right, let's take a look. A 
Okay. So for Aave, my understanding is that you actually need to uh, deposit first in order to borrow. So like you need to deposit collateral and then you can borrow against that collateral. Mm -hmm. So the key things to consider here, like maybe let's just pick like uh, USDC. Um, mm -hmm. So for USDC, in order to, uh, when you're depositing USDC, there's two things to consider here. The deposit APY, so like the annual percentage yield you're going to be receiving for depositing USDC into uh, Aave. And then this rewards APR. Um, so this is basically something that they call an incentivized pool, and it gives you like some extra basically Aave rewards. So you add these two things together to get the total amount of return for depositing the collateral. So these are the first two variables. Uh, deposit APY. And I, I want to just... Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. sorry to interrupt. Just just wanted to add a, a little bit of um, additional information. It's not always that that you're getting rewarded in Ave tokens. You know, I think Polygon, you're actually getting rewarded in Polygon tokens. So it's like I, I think capturing what the what the token denomination is, I think, is important as well. Just a small detail. Mm -hmm. And then the other things that are important are. Well, I guess all of this data, right? <laughs> uh, yep. Like utilization rate, available liquidity, like there has to be enough liquidity for things like slippage. Um, obviously has to be able to be used as collateral. Um, the maximum LTV, so this is the loan to value ratio, right? So, and I assume that like you'd wanna go below this so that you don't get liquidated. I'm not sure what, like the choice of LTV is something that's, I mean, if you use something like, uh, I guess it doesn't really matter because if you use like something like um, DeFi Saver, then like you're protected against ever being liquidated because it'll automatically shift your position for you. But I don't know if we want to like just choose the max LTV or what. I think we, we want to capture what that is, but it'll be a static number for each mm -hmm. combination. But I, I don't think we need to. Yeah, I think that would be more on like how we use the 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 predictions we're making for example right. you know like if, if i if i know that um uh, just a dumb example like okay my the the rate or the the threshold is 82.5 percent so uh but it's super stable and whatever strategy i'm implementing the volatility is like close to zero so then then i might borrow up to that 80 percent uh but let's say i have a strategy where you know, it's somehow not pegged to, to this, it's pegged to ETH or whatever gas price, then I might keep it at 60%. So it's more like an application of the, the output rather than needed for, to make the, the prediction, in my opinion, but I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah it, it also doesn't normal. change over time, I think. So I think it's pretty much fixed for every, every pool. So it's, it's important to know, but there, there's not a, a time series where you can follow that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I might be wrong, but I think it's voted on by governance, but I'm not sure. Oh, yeah? actually. I'm, I'm, I'm not positive. I don't know about that. Yeah, because these numbers look different than the ones I saw a while back. Yeah, when I looked at it. Like they, they look higher, actually. Yeah, I think it was 75 before, um, like a few weeks ago. Okay. I'm sure it says in their docs, though, like how, like why it changes and how it changes. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, I guess these are the other ones. Max LTV, the liquidation threshold, um, and then the penalty. I mean, like if there's a high penalty, you never know. Like it could influence, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. the returns. It could be an important variable. I don't know. Yeah. And I just ask, is this, is depositing just depositing to the liquidity pool? Not yeah. actually. So uh, the option can be used as collateral. That means that if you wanted to borrow, then what you're already providing to the liquidity pool is used as collateral. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But it could be, I mean, it could be a different token. It doesn't have to be USDC. You could borrow ETH if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, look at the spike. Cool. Um, okay, so yeah. the next yeah. borrow. Um, so you can borrow anything based off, well, anything that accepts USDC as collateral, you can borrow. Um, so it wouldn't really make sense to borrow USDC when you deposited USDC, unless 
the rates were such that it was uh, profitable. Um, so I don't know what we want to use an example as um, something. Yeah, well, why, don't, why don't you actually, I, I would pick the USDC because I think um, it's interesting to, to see the, the flip side of everything. Um, so yeah, in this case, the variables to consider actually this isn't showing. So in this case, the the borrowing variable APY, um, important that it's variable versus stable, uh, is three point nine nine. So and then the rewards, which you know you would subtract from that because it's an incentivized pool. Um, these are the these are basically the same two variables, except the variable APY in this case is like what you're being charged uh, as a borrowing fee. Um, so actually, I think this is profitable right now. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't remember the rates from the last page, but, uh, so what is this like 3.79 and the cost of this is like 2.8. So it's actually profitable to, um, do this right now. Yep. Which is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, in this case, those two variables, so the borrow APY and the variable borrow APY and the rewards rate, because it's an incentivized pool, and then kind of the same metrics here, utilization rates, liquidity, asset price, of course. And yeah, that's pretty much so all there is to it, right? Yeah, could, could we say that just like the, the data we want to be able to capture are all these things that are on those, the borrow and, and lend uh, deposit Screens plus just yeah, plus gas. The, yeah, and plus this <laughs> APR. This APR isn't shown. Equally. Yeah, that's not on the screen. That's true. Yeah. And it actually is is a, is quite variable. Yeah, and it's significant because like if this is higher, like if this offsets the cost of borrowing such that the, the like what you earn is more than what you pay for borrowing, then it can be pretty significant. Like this is pretty high right now. Yep. Do you guys think it's, it's important to capture like the Aave data in the sense of how much the protocol Aave has in TVL, how, how many users, stuff like that? Because it, it could be affecting how much incentives they're giving away. Just a thought. Mm. Yeah, the thing is like, I think there's specific like formulas that, that actually tell you how they calculate incentives and things like that. Um, but that's kind of going a level deeper. Um, but I'm pretty sure they show that. It's probably in the white papers somewhere. I, I, I do I do think that um, at, at a minimum, we would want to capture the, the price of the token, the time series uh, of whatever reward token you're getting, just because I, I think people can be fooled a little bit by saying, oh, okay, you know, this is, it's profitable. It's profitable, yes, if, if you're cashing out these reward tokens, but if you're like accumulating tokens that are depreciating in value, you could actually have a, kind of a crappy strategy. Um, so, you know, I would just say, let's look at Ave price or whatever reward token as well. Yeah, I think this is like pegged to the Ave token. Yeah, in yeah. fact, uh, last week, the Ave on Polygon, the incentives rates went up because Matic was going up and the AV AVEX went down because AVEX went down. So mm. you, you, just in a week, like the, the true protocols kind of switched the APR you're getting by lending or borrowing. Yeah, but you're also kind of making an argument for looking a little bit outside of this laser focus we have here. You know, like like what Jakob was saying, yeah, you kind of have to look at what the competition is doing to to make a good prediction. I don't know. You guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so. I like the Jakob's idea because if the borrowing rates between protocols are are going kind of in the same the same uh, form, like if they're correlated somehow, then there's a bigger variable that, that are affecting those, and we should figure that out. I guess, but in, in practical terms, what, what would that look like? Like we, like how would we capture what the, 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 the alternative, the competition is doing? And like, what, what would the data be that, that would, would make capture maybe, this concept? 
Um, so we can, if we have two data sets, uh, one with, with the same parameters, one for Ade and one for compound, maybe we can, uh, maybe we can just train the models for those two respective protocols, but then, but then for, but then we can, um, use data, but then we can switch the data to do to do the predictions, like um, do, uh, put the current parameters from the com from compound to the model that's been trained on Ave data and see what the predictions are. Do the same, do the same thing the other way around. And maybe we can do this for like, uh, for, for past data that it hasn't been trained on so that we know and, and, and see what the, what the test performance is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, if, if that makes sense as a possible approach. Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, this, I mean, this whole project, it's just kind of like, we got to get our hands dirty and start, start playing to see, to see where there's heat and where there's not. So I, I think it's a, I think it's an approach to try, but I, you know, I'm not the data scientist in the room. I mean, yeah, I, I, would, I would just argue, argue for just, just, you know, let's, uh, let's, we've got these different, different pieces of data, plus the tokens, plus maybe gas, um, of a compound. Let's look at Ethereum. It looks like compounds not on Polygon. So I guess that, Maybe that limits our scope to just looking at Ethereum to start. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's simple to just start with that. Kind of like the initial problem that, that you were that you guys were looking at. Um, mm -hmm. but working together to like get all of the data that's required. Um, because I know we were missing a couple of things. Um for example, like uh Pulling in this data specifically, I had a tough time doing. Mm -hmm. Like the actual yeah. reward data. Um, the, the variable APYs for borrowing and depositing is easy to grab, uh, even through the graph. But um, this rewards APR, I couldn't find. I found an explanation for it um, in the Ave docs. But uh, we actually need to like figure out, okay, how do we query, you know, their smart contracts to get that information? Um, I think it says in here. Oh. Is it about the emissions per second, Christian, you're, you're talking about? Like you're kind of giving out the, the emissions Rewards. per second, not the rate? Yeah, I think, uh, like they explained somewhere. Oh, here yeah, we go. Yeah. yeah, so I, I actually put in some work in this and I actually got to figure it out. And my problem okay. was that the decimals they're giving away, like because you have to, to divide every emission by the decimals of the token, but the decimals they're giving away on the graph were wrong. So I kind of have to make a, a, a little bit of a play there to get the decimals from another data source. But I, I, can, I can share with, with you guys, you know, what I did and how, how to fetch that. And we can start getting the as many AVI data we want to. Cool. Cool. Um, but sorry, go ahead, Greg. Uh, yeah. So uh, real quick, uh, we might have covered this on the last call, but do we decide what what uh, granularity we want? Is this like daily? Is it is it hourly? Or is it um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess that's more of a question for, cause like all the V2 has only been out since for like a year, right? So mm -hmm. if we go daily, like that's not a lot of data. Um, so I mm -hmm. suppose for the data scientists in the room, you know, like what's the, what size of data set would be best? Could go by block if you wanted something crazy. Well, mm -hmm. wouldn't be that huge, I'm sure. But um, by block, by hour, minute, day, I guess it also depends on um, like the 
the, the new information that we are able to get from the model, who who can benefit from that and how like how often how often do um do they need to get get this information? Yeah, you asked actually a really good question. Um, because what we saw when we were at least starting to play around with similar data was there are these moments where you have these blips. And, and so, um, for example, when you have that, that arbitrage where you're earning rewards, but then it can go negative for like a, a period of time. So, you know, we were thinking of potentially a, a, a protection strategy. So if, if it does go negative, then like pull out and wait until it goes positive and put it back in. So take it to the extreme level, I think you could, you might want to do that on a block to block basis. Um, so I, I, I guess what a long answer is, <laughs> I think people could find it useful to have at, at, at that level. I just don't know if it's worth the effort for us to, to do it. But if it's not that much more effort, I think there will be value. And I think when Christian, Christian's working on a lot of stuff that is almost like real time strategies, I think you, you think yeah. on a block level, don't you, in general? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, like any arbitrage bot has to work on the block level, but not only that, like avoid being front run as well. Um, that's like one issue as well. But um, yeah, I think the block level makes sense. Like in, in the grand scheme of large data sets, it's not like even if you go at the block level for a year, it's not even, it's not a large data set, you know, compared to like what. I'm sure a lot of people have seen here, like in terms of like financial data sets, like I come from ad tech, we were doing like 500 billion, you know, bid requests a day. So like in the grand scheme of things, it's not uh, like a huge data set, uh, even if you go by block. But the interesting thing is that uh, even going block by block, I think it's fair to, to grab data at that point. But um, for example, like the borrowing rate might not change uh, for like a hundred blocks because mm -hmm or because it only changes when there is a change in like the underlying liquidity pool. Um, mm -hmm. But still, I think it's good to grab it at the most granular level if it's not going to be like a too big of a data set. Yeah. Plus I think it's, you know, I, I know that's not the, the primary objective, but these, these mini insights certainly will be interesting to, to a lot of people, you know, it's just like, Hey, by the way, did you know that the borrowing rates change? at most once every hundred blocks. Like, I just think that would be useful to somebody to figure that out. Uh, and also uh, the borrowing rate might not change every block, but the incentives, they're driven by the, you know, the incentivized token price and that changes block by block. So that rate will probably be changing. And also if you're yeah. depositing a token and borrowing another one, you should be, be aware of liquidation at any moment. Like don't want to be liquidated. So. You should be tracking mm -hmm. your LTV ratio like every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the main difference for like grabbing real time versus historical is is grabbing real time is easier. Like that's one of the reasons I'm and it, like with the, what I'm doing a component like that's just all we need is like real time simulation. Um, but it's easier because like the docs are so descriptive in terms of like just calling their smart contract and having it return like whatever that value is as of the current block where it's historic like no one uh generally caters to like people grabbing historical data um yep, yep. as we as we know <laughs> yeah yeah and and as we're finding in our kind of customer discovery like that's that is the thing like, uh, people really care about that a lot a lot more than I, even i anticipated um so far so um I was going to say something profound. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, so flip my mind, but I, I guess, you know, just, just so we, we can make some solid progress on this um, before the next um, meetup, did you, you, you should be divvy this up. I think we have kind of a rough, a rough scope uh, and it sounds, it sounds like we're going to do just Ethereum as a chain, but we'll do, at least the two protocols, Aave and Compound. Um, I don't know if we decided on which tokens to to track, but it seems like USDC and possibly others. Um, and remind me, is there is there a predictive element to us? And 
because in real time we have all of the borrow rates, right? So what we want to do is figure the borrow rate in the future so we can anticipate it and, and trade, I guess, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. For the tokens yeah. part, I would say stable coins and Ethereum are kind of, of a must because I think they are in both protocols, and I think those are the pools that have the most volume on those protocols. I'm not sure, but I, I, could, I could check it. Uh, is there any, any other you guys think you should include? Yeah. Sounds good for now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I guess Richard, to your your question, is it important that we right now decide what that? I, I don't know the correct term, but like the predictive window for is that is that the right way to think about it? Like how far in the future we want to make the prediction is yeah, is it important definitely. to decide that now. Yeah, like so I've worked with time series a bit before, and sometimes you need to like I'm get, another thing I was thinking when you were chatting is that the like the, the month could be important or like the time of year for the barrel race. There could be like cyclical trends and stuff. And so what you can do is break up time in different ways. And so, so like kind of feature engineer around time. And so um, mm. you know, you might create w uh, one feature that's the month, but maybe another feature is like the quarter and stuff. And so you can just yeah a lot of different features. Uh, from time and then the thing with neural networks uh the other thing i was going to say is that th there's really two questions that we've been talking about the, the first one is can we predict it in the first place and then the second one is if so what are the important features that predict it and so the great thing about neural networks is that you can kind of just throw everything at them they can handle a lot of different inputs and so uh it wouldn't be the worst strategy to just give it everything that we have and then see if we can train the model to to predict uh, and then if we can't, there's no point in doing the, trying to figure out the feature importance because none of the features are important, I guess. Important, so, just random. Yeah, like the more, I think the, I think the biggest challenge is going to be all of the feature engineering. So like, um, like, do we pass in numerical values or do we need to bin it into like certain ranges? Uh, you know, what do we do with the, the time dimension? Um, and just play around with a lot of those and just keep training our models until we get some sort of uh, predictive performance, I guess. Um, we could yeah, maybe exciting. start like a shared document where we can jot down some notes. Yeah, do you want to, we had something, I guess it's a little bit different, but you want to just fork what, what we had. Um, yeah. And we can capture where we, where we landed this week. I think that could be helpful for the starting point. I also uh, have a really interesting other problem, but maybe we can save it for another time. Um, but it's really interesting, kind of like data science problem. Um, but we will give obviously spoil from you No, know, give us a spoiler. <laughs> like you can't just you leave us with a cliffhanger. <laughs> well, so yeah, I'll, I'll just give the primer. I mean, obviously, this is going to be the focus. But um, one of the areas in which uh, companies are really focusing in terms of like optimizations and like uh, predictions is uh, with Uniswap V3, like liquidity provision. Um, because it sets up perfectly for like a data science problem because um, I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar, but like TLDR is that Uniswap V3 basically made a change such that you can decide the range in which you're going to provide liquidity. So if you're providing liquidity to like an ETH DAI um, pool, then you can say, okay, I only want to provide liquidity between $2,500 and like $4,000. And for the amount of time in which Ethereum is within your bounds, aka in the money, you receive LP rewards. And so being and the tighter your bound, the more rewards you receive. And so uh, essentially like having good predictability in terms of like choosing that range uh, can result in like high rewards. Um, and there's a lot of literature and like research that's I'll share in the Discord, which is like uh, people have been basically modeling like the price movements of these assets and using that to decide on what the bounds are, um, such that they can maximize like LP rewards. Um, it's a cool, it's a cool problem space. It's a cool problem, I think, as well. This this might uh, cover a little bit of your 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 thought, Richard, on 
how could it be useful, more useful to uh, Ocean? Because you know, if, if Ocean is trading on Uniswap V3, I think it could be, and it, it would add value to them to, to know what that that range would look like on how people are trading with Ocean. Um, I like that. I don't. I don't know if it, it doesn't really solve. I think the the problem Richard was was lifting up, which is like how how do we how do we show the community that we're we're gonna like this first project would would add value, but maybe just roadmap uh, or parallel project, who knows? Yeah, and it's fine. Like it. to, it's fine for the first project not to be related to Ocean. And maybe it's even better because we can kind of uh, tease them with uh, interesting algorithms mm -hmm. and say, oh, apply for a grant and say, we can, you know, we can build some algorithms for the Ocean ecosystem that would be useful as well. So um, yeah, I think awesome. it's a really interesting uh, proof of concept anyway. Uh, so Excellent. yeah, as Greg said, uh, we had this document we were working on on kind of a data science project I'll, I'll share on Discord and we can uh, swift that into our project and you can write down whatever you want and the next steps you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, we're coming up on time, but I think it would be nice to at least roughly say oh, yeah. who, who's going to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't, with my capabilities, I, I, I wouldn't know how to to extract this data on the block level, do you, Christian, is this something that either you could you could tackle or, or help us understand so we can tackle? Yep, uh, I can. I can actually just like send uh, in the Discord. I can just send like the June queries um, that I used to get the data that we already have, um, and then we just got to figure out. I, I mean, Yago sounds like you you made steps to figure out how to get the rewards data. But I can share like those queries just so you can see like what the logic is behind. Uh, like I have it by day now, but like I literally just have to change the dates. Like I changed it such that I pull it by day. So if we just get rid of that, it'll pull, pull it by block number. Yeah, I, I can share a little uh, script uh, on getting historical from Avi, a Python script, and then you can guys can go over that and work on that on top of that as well. I haven't worked with compound data never really checked their super graph and stuff. So I can start there. Yeah, and I have some compound queries like on Dune. Oh yeah, I okay. Yeah. Awesome. And there's a lot on there. Like if you just look up compound, there's like hundreds of queries, but really? some of them are okay. obviously garbage. Uh, so like, yeah, <laughs> the best ones are usually uploaded though. So. I think it, will, it will, would be helpful to have someone tracking the more general data, like gas prices and token prices. What do you guys think? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Why, why yeah so I think I shared in. Uh, oh, sorry, Richard. Go ahead. I was just going to say why this is interesting is um, like it's quite typical in data science problems um, for a data scientists to not understand the domain that they're working in, and so like uh, you guys are the domain experts, and so we we don't have that much experience with the financial data, but like obviously want to dive in, so like any resources you can help uh, getting us up to speed on doing analytics and all that sort of stuff is much appreciated. Yeah. If you're calling me an expert, I'm, I'm, you know, we're all screwed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we'll learn, we'll, we'll learn with each other together. Great. Awesome. Um, just a one, one final question. Um, will we need to kind of have the data ready to in order to think about uh, the model itself or, or is it something we can parallel process uh, i think we need the data first i would say I, I have a kind of idea for a time series model that i would try first um, yeah. but to play around with that I'm, we need the, the data so yeah i would say data first and then maybe we can try okay. a few different models Awesome. And um, anything else, Richard, that you think, you know, just kind of comparing this to the, 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 uh, the art project that you were working on, anything else that we need to cover as a, a working group in order to move to like, um, maybe we can create a uh, GitHub repo with like uh, Kanban boards and start putting up some issues and stuff. And um, yeah, just some coordination that way. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. Just any ways that we can kind of synchronize better, uh, between the week, between the weekly hacks, I think would be great. And sure. Yeah, what do you guys think in terms of uh, uh, open source? Um, 
like should we keep the repo private uh, to begin with or like in the open uh, like what do you think about the financial channel and stuff as well what would you guys prefer i'm easy uh i think it's fine to have it open initially uh, yeah. I think so. okay great yeah yeah that, that, that's what i was hoping for yeah like um like especially for a proof of concept i think it's great to like do open source and hopefully we can get some other people hacking on it and stuff as well um, perfect and yeah just like a we can show a really good use case for machine learning in financial data i think that'd be really valuable so great excited awesome guys i, I gotta jump but um i'm glad that we we made some progress so thanks thanks everybody cool yeah really I'll interesting see you in the metaverse all right take care yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.